It's my pleasure to be here, and I welcome you all to come out on this beautiful Hawaiian day. Um, rheumatoid arthritis is a interesting disease. It's a model of autoimmune diseases, and some of you may have heard of it. Some of you may know somebody who has rheumatoid arthritis. Um, I count myself in your generation. Um, over the 65, and I know that uh, we all worry about arthritis as we get older, but rheumatoid arthritis is not one that you need to particularly worry about, but I think you should know about it. So I'm going to go through um, a description of what rheumatoid arthritis is um, and um, epidemiology and some insights into the disease and how the history of treatment has evolved. And I have seen it in my uh, medical career and you may know rheumatoid arthritis from its older manifestations, which is much worse than it is today because of the treatments and because of research insights. So um, I want to tell you how it's changed and give you an idea of what our current guidelines are for treatment and maybe think about what the future might be. Let me make sure I do this right. I did. Okay. So we call rheumatoid arthritis a systemic, which means it affects more than just one system in the body, uh, autoimmune disease. It has significant fatigue associated with it, like almost all other autoimmune diseases. And, you know, one of the things that you're hearing about and learning about is why is it so people so fatigued after having long COVID? This is a new thing. We're going to learn about what's causing this fatigue, but I think it's going to help us understand the fatigue and maybe treat the fatigue in some of our chronic autoimmune diseases. So, uh, in rheumatoid arthritis, joint inflammation is the most uh, uh, characteristic. And it can involve mostly the hands and feet, but just about any joint in the body, including the temporomandibular joint, is what opens and closes when you open and close your mouth, and some joints you've never heard of, such as crico or retinoid joint. Don't worry about it. You don't need to know about that one. Um, but it also uh, usually spares the lower back for some reason, even though there are other inflammatory conditions that can hit the lower back. It doesn't mean somebody with rheumatoid arthritis can't have back pain because there are so many different ways of having back pain, but it's usually not due to the inflammatory process. So characteristically, the joints involved, which is characteristic of autoimmune disease arthritis, is the knuckle joints, we call the metacarpal phalangeal joints, and this middle joints, or we call proximal interphalangeal joints, and not the ones at the very end. And I'll go over some differentials with you a little bit later to show you how it was. But because of your function, you need to use your hands so much, the inflammation in these joints can involve um, a lot of problems with doing daily things. And there are people who can do this very well. They figure out a ways around it and others that can't. And the reason they can't, they're just not creative, but there's so much pain that they can't do it. So we help each other with, with that when and if we can't treat the arthritis. So this is a, uh, a photo. You don't see my hand, so I'll do, do this one. Okay. So this is, ooh, that's a big marker. This is the area that looks swollen. I think even you, non-trained, you're not trained rheumatologist yet, but you will be when you leave. You can see the swelling in these joints. So if you have those, that kind of swelling, make sure that that person sees a physician and asks, maybe they need to see a specialist because there are special treatments that may be needed and to keep it from progressing from major disability. Um, this is a, a patient who has, has the inflammation at these joints. You can see they look a little funny. Okay, and this is soft tissue. It's not bony. It's soft, it's mushy, and it's painful, and it could be red and, and, and um, uh, warm. But the effect on, when these joints are affected by inflammation, it causes some um, uh, effect on the tendons of the leaders into the hand. And this person's trying to make a fist, and they can't. They can't bend the fingers the right way because of that inflammation effect on the tendons. Even though these joints, in the middle joints here, um, these, one, these joints may not be affected uh, with the inflammation, they be, may be affected because the tendons are. So someone who's got that problem might only be able to flex at the the metacarpal phalangeal joints and not be able to make a fist. And you can imagine how interfering that is with your usual daily functions. Okay, um, I'm going to skip the x-ray here. Um, this x-ray demonstrates a normal on the left and on the right where these 
joins themselves. You can see they look funny, and I won't go over the radiological things about that, but this is a, x-rays will show this, um, and this is a patient even with more advanced disease, and this patient has some nodules and the inability to use their joints normally, but many people can use them well, even though they're not normally around. The feet can be involved, and um, you can see a characteristic, oops, let me go back. Well, I don't have to. Okay, I can't go back. How do I go back? I don't know. Aha, I got it. Okay, thank you. So this is a patient with a different kind of arthritis. This is a patient with osteoarthritis of the hand. And I show this picture. It's not inflammatory. We don't know what the cause is, and we're getting to exp <clears throat> some research to figure out way maybe what it is. But this is the most common kind of arthritis. Rheumatoid arthritis may hit maybe 1.5 to 2% of the population at some time. Up to 60% of people will have some form of osteoarthritis, and one of the common ones are in the hand. This may not even be symptomatic. It just may look knobby knuckles, but the knuckles that are knobby are the middle ones, the PIPs, and the distal ones. So you may have relatives, and if it's a mother or a grandmother, I'm sorry to say you may get this too if you haven't gotten it. But in many patients, it's not symptomatic in the way of being painful, but it may be interfering with uh, daily functions. And this is just a demonstration, a picture of the same things. It's a different set of joints. Now, why does the body do that? We have no idea. I have not seen the research to tell us what's the biological difference between a metacarpal phalangeal joint, a proximal, the middle joints, and the distal joints. We use them differently, for sure, but there's no good explanation for this. It'll be interesting when we find out. And this is the same sort of a thing about where the... Uh, involvement is. The wrists are frequently involved in rheumatoid arthritis, but not in osteoarthritis. So um, what happens in rheumatoid arthritis is we're not sure. There are a bunch of uh, autoimmune and autoantibodies that occur, and <clears throat> I can't even be sure why it is the joints are prominent, but they are. But these antibodies called rheumatoid factor, which is common, it gets more common in as we all age. Not that it means you have rheumatoid arthritis, it's just a, 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 a biological marker and an antibody that occurs. It occurs with a lot of other diseases, so it's not specific to rheumatoid arthritis. And about um, 80 to 90 percent of patients with rheumatoid arthritis will have rheumatoid factor positivity in a high level, or a high titer, we call it. Um, and in the, I guess it was the 80s, we discovered this um, <clears throat> moiety called anti-CCP, or cyclic uh, citrullinated peptide antibody in rheumatoid arthritis. And everybody got all excited. We know the cause now because this antibody is so high and proteins become citrullinated, but we don't know why. <laughs> and there's antibodies to it, but it's not the cause of rheumatoid arthritis. It's just a great marker because it's very specific. Very few other autoimmune inflammatory diseases and certainly not um, in osteoarthritis. None of those have these antibodies. So it's extremely helpful uh, to be able to define the disease better. Um, so there are other genetic markers that people have looked at and said, well, maybe we can find the gene and fix it, because now we can fix genes. But we can't. So this gene is called HLA-DRB1 subtypes, and it seems to be more common in people who have... And it appears that that particular genetic predisposition may help those people who get exposures to have more rheumatoid arthritis. And it, this is a purely uh, coincidental exposure. We're not exactly sure how it works, but people who have exposure to smoking, smoking is an, a risk factor for rheumatoid arthritis. So for all the other reasons you should quit smoking, rheumatoid arthritis is another one. Or any inflammatory disease is another reason. So there's no reason to smoke cigarettes or tobacco. Now, it turns out if you live near a freeway, you also have a higher risk, population risk. This has nothing to do with individuals who get rheumatoid arthritis. So there's a, a thought that there is some uh, antigenic or some environmental toxin that is inhaled, and the exposure may be through the lungs. Exactly how that citrullinates proteins and causes rheumatoid arthritis is unknown directly, but it's a very interesting phenomenon. Um, now, we talked about genetic predisposition, but when only 8 or 15 percent of identical twins also have rheumatoid arthritis, it is clearly not 
any genetic disease. Slightly more common in people with autoimmune diseases of any type, but it's not a directly uh, inheritable disease. Like, there are others that do that, but not rheumatoid arthritis. And only 4% of non-identical twins may have rheumatoid arthritis, and only 1.2 to 2% of the population has it. So there's something genetic, but it's not a very strong influence. Um, I left off the ones. RA is actually found in about 1.5% of the population, depending on what population you look at. There are some populations that have a higher uh, incidence of rheumatoid arthritis. A certain um, Native Hawaiian, I'm sorry, Native uh, American populations have a higher incidence. And these are being studied, but no good, great answers have come out. Now, there are variable associations in the literature with people with a gum disease, periodontal disease. And now that all this uh, attention is being paid to the, quote, microbiome, maybe there are intestinal bacteria that this is associated with. But there's a, a lot of articles and a lot of uh, suppositions, but no proof. So um, there's susceptibility and some unknown uh, environmental trigger. That's all we can say right now about who gets it. Um, I did this. The answer is we don't know. So when I said this is a systemic disease, <clears throat> um, there are other parts of your body that can be involved if, in a patient who has rheumatoid arthritis. So we talked about the joints, and now I'm going to talk about other parts of the body. So the minor areas that can be involved are things called rheumatoid nodules. That's an accumulation of certain inflammatory tissue in certain places, and I'll show you some pictures in a little bit. These tend not to be painful. They not to be, get in the way of what you do. They may look ugly, but that's about all. And I'll show you how the pictures can be ugly, but they're not a... They don't cause disease or disability. You can get inflammation of the uh, whites of the eyes. That can be uncomfortable, but it usually doesn't lead to any uh, uh, loss of vision. Um, now, sensory neuropathy, feeling numbness and tingling, can be very uncomfortable. But I say minor in the sense it doesn't lead to the serious consequences of the major ones that I'll talk next. People with rheumatoid arthritis, sometimes when you do an x-ray for whatever reason, as long as you find some what looks like might be fluid under the lungs, and that's plural in this word. This, oops, that's the wrong one. There's the thing here. Plural, which means that there's fluid in the lung, pericarditis. It could be some fluid around the heart, and some, it's usually asymptomatic and can be found. We know there's inflammation there, and in very rare cases, it gets uh, seriously symptomatic and needs to be treated separately. Uh, that occurs in other uh, inflammatory diseases like lupus, too. And then uh, something called Raynaud's phenomenon, I'll show you what that is, which is a high, just a really uh, increased sensitivity to cold, which causes finger blanching. It can be very uncomfortable, but it usually doesn't lead to uh, automatic um, amputations, etc. that Raynaud's could in other diseases, but not in rheumatoid arthritis. Now, the more um, serious ones, which are rare... Nowadays, they used to be more common before we had effective treatments, are things like vasculitis, where the blood vessels themselves are inflamed due to these antibodies floating around, and can cause skin rashes, it can cause nerve damage from the vasculitis and some other things. But again, nowadays, it's extremely rare. Felty syndrome, which is an uh, enlargement of the spleen and a reduction in a bunch of very important white blood cells that keep you safe from infections, and sometimes platelet count, which keeps you safe from bleeding, can occur. Again, rare. Then you can have weakness because the nerves that go to the muscles could be affected, but that's, again, very rare. Lung disease due to rheumatoid arthritis can be very, very serious, but it's very, very rare. And then uh, because of the inflammation in the body, and almost any continuously inflammatory disease leads to low bone mass. And as we all age, we are all losing bone as we're here, especially since we're sitting. But that's a, a characterization of age also. But on top of that, medications can cause bone loss, and on top of that, inflammation, chronic inflammation can. So this is a picture of a rheumatoid nodule. I don't know if you've ever seen them. They could be where these are, right at the, uh, not quite at the elbow tip, but frequently they're at the elbow tip. And the complaint to patients is, I can't rest my elbow. It's kind of mushy, and I, can you do something about that? Not pain and not, or it's ugly. I don't want to wear anything except long sleeves. No. 
and these are other places they can occur, frequently in the upper extremities. And any places where bony prominences are, and they rub on things. I had one patient who was bed-bound, and she had a nodule right in the back of her head where, where she was rubbing against the bed. This is Raynaud's phenomenon, where the blood vessels uh, constrict excessively in response to cold. Now I say, oh, you can't have that in Hawaii. It's warm. Well, you know how many times we go into really cold things. I was at Safeway the other night, and I froze. That can induce Raynaud's symptoms or Raynaud's uh, lack of, uh, of circulation. Now, when you lose circulation to a finger, you could actually have a really lot of damage. But for whatever reason, this is rare in rheumatoid arthritis, but it can occur in other autoimmune inflammatory diseases. So in this patient, you see on the, on the right side, whoops, we'll go back this way. No, nope, I didn't do that right. What did I do right? Oh. Okay, on the, uh, the, uh, the hand, the right hand, of, this is probably a different patient. Um, you can see it's kind of blue and dusky. And then the, on the left side is where the, the circulation that started to be reduced on the blue side now is significantly reduced and it became white. So it actually causes red, white, and blue color changes. Okay. Um, so we call that extra-articular disease. It means that rheumatoid arthritis has other things that can happen. And... Um, uh, there's also an increase uh, of cardiovascular disease, but that occurs with almost all autoimmune diseases. So another reason to not smoke, because that increases the cardiovascular risk. Um, so heart attacks are more common in people with rheumatoid arthritis if, we can, if, if it's uncontrolled. And I want to put that in. I didn't put this on the slide. Um, that the risk is probably reduced under, I don't know why I wrote local, but the current treatment, which is uh, interesting. It used to be said that um, having rheumatoid arthritis uh, shortened everyone's life by 10 years, and it was equivalent to having um, a lymphoma disease, a high level. And that was from the days when we didn't have effective treatment, but that's no longer probably the case. Oh, I said that here. All right. I'm going to go on. So I'm going to review where we've been about treatment options. So the first slide is this very complex one. I had trouble putting in here, but I'm going to ex expand it to show you. But this comes from the 1800 BC <laughs> until modern days, so it's, it's hard to put on one slide. So this is the very beginning. The ancient era, they probably first described um, a case of rheumatoid arthritis in an ancient text in 1800 BC. Can you imagine? We thought rheumatoid arthritis was a modern disease, but it's not. Uh, it was finally named in uh, 1890, and then they finally figured out that maybe aspirin would work. Good old aspirin in 1899. Okay. Then you have a skip over to 1929. There was nothing except aspirin. And I will tell you, as we get on, there was nothing until probably the 1980s that was as good as aspirin. Okay, that's a long history of using aspirin. And aspirin was around for a long time. It was discovered from the bark of a willow tree. And it effectively treats inflammation, not takes it away, but it helps reduce some of the symptoms. And then in the 1920s, it was thought that when they looked at the tissue pathology in those nodules and other areas inside the joints, some pathologists said, hey, this looks a little bit like TB. And they had no effective treatments for TB in the 1920s, but they were trying something called gold, gold salts or other heavy metal salts. And so gold was introduced. We actually gave intramuscular gold injections. It had to be in the buttocks because it was a fair amount of stuff that you had to put in. And I used them in the 70s and the early 80s. And, it was, and I'll show you this, but that we didn't have good treatments. Most people couldn't tolerate it too long, and it probably helped a little bit we have no idea why it would have helped. It probably interferes with some cellular functions and reduced the ability for some of the autoantibodies to work, but it did help a little bit. So come along in 1946, Dr. Philip Hench, who was the only rheumatologist ever to get a Nobel Prize, discovered how to synthesize corticosteroids or cortisone, actually. And he demonstrated this with a rheumatoid arthritis patient who was very, very crippled in a wheelchair he gave her an injection of his new medicine, and she got up from her wheelchair and walked across the stage. This was a game changer at that time. Unfortunately, no one knew how to use it, and it was overdosed, and it had so many side effects that it 
it, it's be, it, we still use it, but we only use it very cautiously because of the side effects. But that was a big change, but it didn't change much. It just gave some people more relief. And then in 19, um, for, later 48, there was a new drug called phenylbutazone. Some people may know it as bute. Anybody have horses here? Okay, it's a, it, they use it for anti-inflammatory in horses now. That was the first non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug. Now, you know other non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. We call them NSAIDs, and one of those is ibuprofen. Okay, but the first was phenylbutazone, and it was a very effective anti-inflammatory. I remember using it for gout, and it was of eczema. The trouble is it killed your bone marrow, and there were people who died because of bone marrow failure due to this drug. So it was taken off the market, except for horses. I guess they, maybe they don't have the, the bone marrow problems with it. Then in 1950s, um, due to an accident of occurrence, these things called anti-malarials, and you probably have heard of these, it's called, uh, the one we use nowadays is called hydroxychloroquine or Plaquenil. You may have heard of it because there was a big push during COVID to use it. But this drug was used to prevent malaria. And there were people who were in a place where they had to have malaria prevented and they had rheumatoid arthritis and someone noticed hey, their arthritis got better. So it became a fairly constant treatment that we used after that in modulated doses. Actually, the first one was called chloroquine, which was bad for the eyes, and we had to, it was modified to hydroxychloroquine, and it was very effective. So you can hear the history of this is mostly consequential. It wasn't any targeted way of, of treating this disease. And that was until, um, no, no, 1965 was another new anti-inflammatory called endomethacin, which is so strong it, it damaged kidneys and livers, but it was effective. And then in the uh, 1970s, there were other um, anti-inflammatories in Motrin and, and Naproxen, you may have heard of those since then, have come up on the market. And then the, in, in, in my, um, uh, I put this in bold print, methotrexate came around in the 1980s. Methotrexate was used to alter the, uh, the cellular response in cancer. It was discovered it might also affect the immune system in rheumatoid arthritis, and it was started to be used then. And this was a major game changer, because we now had something that we thought was actually hitting the cause of rheumatoid arthritis. We're still using it today. It's in a, a, a much lower dose than we would use for cancer. And it's a weekly uh, tablets, and it's easy to take. Um, and it helps support the other medications that we're using today. And then as time went on, um, we, we used other uh, infl um, modulators in the immune system. One of those is called cyclosporin. Cyclosporin, we're still using today when we need to, but that's used in, uh, in, in a way in, in many patients who have uh, transplants to suppress the immune response to that. Celebrex, which is a, was a, a kind of a game changer because it's a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug that doesn't affect, badly affect the, uh, the stomach. And so that was a fairly good game changer because methotrexate wasn't enough. Patients on methotrexate might have needed one or two other things. And one of the other things I skipped over was something called sulfasalazine, which is a drug that we had used for inflammatory bowel disease, and we found it works for rheumatoid arthritis too. We have a, now we're starting to get a lot more drugs that we can use, and sometimes in combinations, they did a great job. Um, in 1998, uh, a cousin of methotrexate called leflunamide, I won't go into that because it's not used quite as much, came about. But at the same time, um, the ability to manipulate some of the inflammatory tissues, and this started the push to what we call anti-tumor necrosis factor inhibitors. It doesn't mean that it, these have anything to do with tumors. They're just the way the, the uh, uh, chemicals in the body, the cell um, communicators were called, just because of how they were discovered. But the uh, anti-TNF um, was started with this drug called Etanercept, which you may have heard of as Enbrel. I think they're still advertising it on TV. Um, and that was in the, like the late 90s, okay? And followed pretty quickly with other anti-TNF inhibitors. And the most common one now you've heard about is Humira or adalimumab, which 
working in the VA, it's one of the most, ex the most commonly prescribed expensive drug that we have. <clears throat> and our money, a lot of money is being spent on it because of what it can do. And these drugs, again, have changed. We don't see those major extra-articular manifestations anymore. I've not seen it since probably the 90s. Now, I don't have a lot of rheumatoid patients now in my practice, but we're not seeing the really bad rheumatoid arthritis except for those people who have never had any treatment, who still come to us after having it for a number of years. So as we go forward on this list, there are some other names that you may or may not recognize. And um, I, I think I don't have another slide, but I want to show you. We started looking at other uh, cell uh, uh, anti uh, TNF is a, it's a uh, chemical that talks to cells and gets cells to do different things depending on what's necessary. So it reduces inflammation because it pro TNF uh, promotes inflammation. So having an antibody to it, Humira and Etanercept, did help rheumatoid arthritis remarkably well. And then um, IL-6 was one that also works. And this was developed for rheumatoid arthritis and other inflammatory diseases. And you may recognize that tocilizumab that became a very useful drug with uh, COVID um, inflammatory conditions that made COVID worse. Not the infection, but the triggering of the inflammatory system. So all these drugs came into use with, with COVID. It was, it's amazing. But what we're going to learn from all of this, and we haven't quite learned it yet, is how the virus and the immune system and triggering the immune system for long-term symptoms is going on. And this is we're in the middle of that whole long COVID, um, chronic fatigue syndrome. Um, we're learning about it and what it is. It's not thought to be what people thought in the past. It was just somebody's, they're kind of weird and they just, they just over complained. It's not the case. There's something going on and exactly what it is, we're not sure. A lot of research going on for that. So well, after the um, two, two, 2012 and after, and actually more recently, this, this whole class of drugs is called JAK inhibitors. JAK is short for uh, Janus kine, kinase um, activation. There, it's another cell-to-cell -cell signaling device, and this is a much more pr uh, primal than TNF and IL-6. And those drugs are very effective. And the benefits of those drugs turn out to be they're oral. You take it by tablet every day, whereas the TNF inhibitors you had to take by infection, by in injection. But it's self-injection, and it worked very, very well. The problem with Jack right now is the side effects are kind of worrisome. There was one study that showed people who had heart disease had worse heart disease. Uh, there's a suggestion that maybe people would have a little bit more blood clots. We don't know why these drugs would do this, but this is all under study. So I am cautious in using it, although, again, they're very effective for the treatment of rheumatoid arthritis. I just don't want to make my patients worse if I have drugs that were more effective. So I ended this with the... Uh, question marks, because I don't know where we're going. I think we're going, and it's not just rheumatoid arthritis that's going to benefit from this. All diseases that um, need to be manipulated or do manipulate the immune system will be affected by all these drugs. So what we found out is that we have to treat this disease, but the earliest we treat it, the better it is for the damage that may occur to joints over time. So start early. And how do you start early? Well, when the symptoms start. Rheumatoid arthritis is suspected if someone has inflammatory joint symptoms, and I'll tell you what those are in a minute, that last more than six weeks. The reason six weeks is that there are conditions, like just having a viral infection that can cause you to have swollen joints, tender joints, that last, but it goes away. There are probably other reasons you might, that might happen, but when it goes away, we're usually not worried about it as a, as a progressive uh, de, uh, deforming disease. So if rheumatoid arthritis can be diagnosed early and treated early, it doesn't progress. It doesn't hit the other major organs, and it doesn't damage joints, which is great. You know, and maybe, maybe it'll be cheaper to treat. That's the other thing, is we won't have to use the big guns. So how do we know? Who's going to get it? 
Well, we don't. Two percent of the population is, uh, is, is a small number, so we can't test everybody to see if they're going to have it. Though there are tests going on to see if we could name it ahead of time. There was, um, I'll, oh, this is the next one, I'll look at it. But, sorry. Okay, so lifestyle management is important. We think anti-inflammatory diets may be useful. Nobody's done enough studies to know what that will be, but look at the literature and you'll see, I think uh, what's called anti-inflammatory diets are healthy. Mediterranean diet, for instance, good for everything else, so it's good for rheumatoid arthritis. Maintain all your motion, rest when fatigued, rather than um, toughing to, uh, trying to tough through things and then get frustrated. I work at the VA, and all of my uh, patients are former soldiers, and to tell them they can't tough through something is, is a game changer for them. I said, no, you've got to listen to your body. And then you can do more. But if you don't listen to it now, you're going to be hurting more. And so, you know, there's the, um, the Marines say, no pain, no gain. Or pain means weakness is leaving your body. No, I'm sorry, not when you have these inflammatory diseases. And that goes for other people too, not just the former military. But just remember that. Listen to your body, but don't coddle it so much that you stop moving. That's an important one. Um, so therapies for comfort are important, partly because it helps relieve the symptoms and relieves the mental stress. And we're finding out that the neurological system and um, uh, brain stress increases inflammation. Now, exactly how that happens, we still have to learn. This has been discussed since... That's not my phone. Okay, good. <laughs> this has been discussed since the 70s, but the ac exact mechanisms are not there. So, um, Tai Chi, learn balance, learn motion, and learn quiet. All of these things are good for anything that you have, but particularly for the inflammatory conditions, and we probably didn't pay enough attention to doing that. Psychological support. Now, I remember one patient I had, a young woman who had some young children, and, and she had really hard to control rheumatoid arthritis, and this was in the early 80s. We had just... I was a little nervous about using methotrexate in this woman who of childbearing age, because methotrexate can destroy a pregnancy in a... In a, a um, uh, be dangerous for the child. So she was really suffering, and I was doing what I could. And then all of a sudden, for one of appointments, she came in, and she said, I'm fine now, Doc. And she, her inflammation was almost all gone. And I said, what happened? And she said, you know, it was hard enough to have arthritis, but I realized being depressed about it was just as was worse. So she changed her mindset. And, you know, this always has... Re I remember this for a long time. Changing mindset has something to do with your immune system. So, you know, work on it. Get psychological support. See how you can contribute to some of these things in any painful condition that's useful. So, the common treatments, modified drugs, we call them DMARDs, or disease-modifying um, anti-rheumatic um, drugs. Um, uh, one of my... There was a, an attempt to call them disease-undermining drugs. And my mentor at the time said, that means they're duds. And at the time, they were duds. <laughs> they didn't do it. So we, I'm glad that they got rid of that uh, uh, abbreviation from duds. But now it's DMARDs, and you may hear that term. So this is a list of all of them that we could be using. And the very last category are called biologics, because they hit the biological systems that uh, cause inflammation. So these are another list. I'll go beyond this. So current guidelines. Medical management is one strategy. So start with methotrexate. And if a person is having really struggling with severe inflammation, uh, steroids or cortisone, prednisone is the one we usually use. It's an oral form. And it, you, we can use it as needed, but we have to be careful of it. Too much of it um, aggravates diabetes. Too much of it can cause skin... Um, uh, skin and not cause infections, but make you more susceptible to infections. It can um, increase bone loss. There's a lot of side effects for prednisone. So we have to balance the benefits to the risks. And if, uh, if it keeps someone moving and out of bed, prednisone is worth it. If it. And low dose, as low dose as we can get away with. If there's no response to methotrexate in three months, we could add something. And hydroxychloroquine or plaquenil is the next one with sulfasalazine. Now, the combination of methotrexate, hydroxychloroquine, and sulfasalazine, methotrexate once a week, hydroxychloroquine twice a day, sulfasalazine two to three times a day, it's a lot of drugs, okay, will cost about $300 a month. 
All right. Now, we can do the same effect and get just as much improvement with something like Humira, one shot every two weeks at a cost of $5,000 a month. So which do you choose? <laughs> I mean, it's really a difficult one. Insurance, if you 20% of your uh, co-pays are there, it's still pretty, pretty, it's a decision. And the, the, the news is interesting. Despite the different mechanisms of action, they work just about the same. 60% of people will get an initially good response to either of these drugs. So it's very interesting. Keep tuned. There'll be more coming down. So if there's no response to adding a biologic or a TNF, and, I mean, uh, to the, three, the triple drug combination, then you can add something like a biologic, like Humira, if, if necessary, if someone's arthritis is really flaring. And if that doesn't work, try another one. And if that doesn't work, look at some of the newer um, uh, uh, disease-modifying agents in the biological category. These are, your doctor does this, you don't do it. Okay, the second um, par uh, possible training is start with all three drugs. Get on top of it right away. Um, I have a hard time selling that to my patients, so I don't actually get it done very often. And if that doesn't work, then you go to the start with the biologic treatment like TNF inhibitors. Right now, who knows what's going to happen in the next 10 years. We'll probably have a different paradigm of treatment. But the point is to treat it, just not say, well, it's an attitude issue. The person is just complaining. No, it's got to be treated while they do the psychological management and the stress management. So how can it be prevented? There's a lot of studies looking at it. Can we predict who's going to get it, and can we prevent it? That would be better. We know we want to prevent heart disease. We don't want to treat it. We want to prevent cancer. We don't want to treat it. So the same thing for these inflammatory conditions. But it's much more difficult for rare diseases that we have no, um, no um, uh, specific uh, way to predict it ahead of time. Now, we did find there was a military study where they took some blood from the military recruits when they came into whatever they did. And what they went back and got those samples out and looked at them for markers of rheumatoid arthritis when the soldier developed rheumatoid arthritis. There were very few of them, of course, but they all had markers. Almost all of them had markers, particularly the CCP antibody, which was never tested in the old days. But it was there when they didn't have any symptoms. So that might be a marker, but we can't test everybody for that. That would be ridiculous for 2%. So looking at different ways, and people are looking at people who have the symptoms, and I'll tell you, I said I would tell you what they are. And that is stiffness in a rising in the morning that lasts more than an hour, particularly in the small joints of your hands, wrists, feet, or knees. The critical thing is it lasts despite movement, and it eventually gets better. This suggests there's inflammation in those joints. And then looking at the joints I told you are more, more critical and more likely to be inflammatory, and those are the knuckle joints and the middle finger joints. And if indeed pollution has something to do with it, or the microbiome has something to do with it, maybe we need to manipulate and make sure we're doing that. But the bottom line is take good care of your teeth. Have healthy food intake to feed the right bacteria in your, in your intestines, and maybe you won't get rheumatoid arthritis. But those studies, you know how long, it will take 15 years to do a study like that, and nobody's insuring to do that. Oh, who, who pays for drugs? Uh, who pays for studies? The drug companies. Why would they do something that doesn't cost, will not help them develop a new drug? So we look to the National Institutes of Health and other places, but there, there are some studies going on, but they're not going to give us any answers in the very, very near future. So what's in the future? Well, one is they discovered if they stimulate the vagal nerve, which goes from the brain down to the heart into the, um, uh, the, the things that you don't have conscious control of. Let me just say that. That's like your intestines, et cetera. Stimulation of that nerve has reduced inflammation. We need to learn why and how to do it better. So you might start seeing, once this comes out as, oh, this could happen, someone's going to sell you something. <laughs> you know, and it's already started. They have external nerve stimulators, and they keep uh, they say it'll cure your arthritis, but we don't know that for sure. So watch out. It becomes another um, kind of an industry outside of true medicine, but it won't hurt. Gene therapy, can we define how to fix the genes so that these inflammatory things don't happen? Perhaps. We don't know yet. Um, once we figure out uh, 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 seasonal or circadian triggers, like are you more susceptible if you don't sleep well at night? if your circadian rhythms are off. 
Okay. Are there hormonal tre treatments, uh, hormonal tr triggers? Since rheumatoid arthritis is more common in women, what's the why? Is there a hormonal thing? Is it an X chromosome thing? What is it? We don't know. Oh, and then I skipped the bi microbiome. I had already talked about that. Maybe we'll find something that triggers it in the intestines and we can fix it. But that has not come out to mean anything yet. So we've come a long way since 1800 BC, <laughs> but we've got a long way to go. So we're still treating the disease and the manifestations, which is joint pain and swelling. And we can, most cases, either take it away or reduce it to a great extent. And we've eliminated a lot of the negative things that happen, like increased heart attacks, and probably have affected not as much people not dying 10 years before their peers, we think. But that's, those studies are hard to actually come by. But we're going someplace. So remember, rheumatoid arthritis is a very serious form of arthritis. It's not very common. Okay, and a lot of people get confused, and if you're worried that you or a loved one has rheumatoid arthritis, have someone check it out. Okay, this inflammatory symptoms are important to know about, um, and have someone check it out with a physician and ask if they need to see a specialist just to confirm that it's not something serious or that it is, and it needs more advanced treatment. So I'm ready for any questions. I don't know how, if we have any time for them. Uh, Dr. Masaki will kick me out if we don't. Thank you so much, Mary Ann. Wonderful presentation. Thank you. Thank you for your attention. We do have a little time for questions. So I think Chang is carrying around the mic. Oh, First okay. question. Hello. Hi. Thank you. That's a big yeah, mic. I have a question. Is it uh, diet is make some, make some uh, reduce this RA or OA that you are talking about? Diet? How about the diet? Uh, not only dependent on medicine, that's what we are ask, you are asking for. Is diet can help us if we practice some good diet or something like that? You know, when they've looked at the studies, they, they can't connect it to a specific diet, but we do know people who have inflammation are better when their diet is modulated to an anti-inflammatory. They feel better. So, for instance, some people say, whenever I eat things in what's called the um, uh, nightshade family, tomatoes, potatoes, uh, peppers, eggplants, my arthritis is a little bit worse, but if I stay away from it, I'm better. Yeah. I say stay away from them. <laughs> you know, stay be better. Away from them. But we don't know what those triggers are. Some okay. people say the same thing about milk, but very few. And some people say if I eat chicken, I'm better. We have no good uh, medical uh, 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 standard scientific information to support that. But if a patient has that experience, I, they should go with it. But will the anti-inflammatory diets be in, improve people's health? We think so. We think staying away from some of the um, over-processed foods may help too. But again, there's not good studies. Is it, why does that happen? Is it has to do with the microbiome or the, the bacteria in your gut? I don't know. You know. Maybe we'll figure this out and see the reason. And not, not to treat it with the special medicine, but I'm sure the drug companies would love to give you a pill with the right bugs in it so you could not have the inflammation. But if you can do it by diet, it's much better. So all the people trying to get us to eat correctly and not pig out on the wrong things have a good thing behind them. So just watch out for strange, uh, strange diets and okay. look at what's called anti-inflammatory diet and it's not anything strange. Or the Mediterranean diet, which is basically anti-inflammatory. So I can't tell you, it won't do anything for uh, osteoarthritis that we're aware of. It might do something for other inflammatory conditions. Exercise, physical therapy, a spa? Exercise, I stopped using that word. <laughs> okay? <laughs> All right? Um, and then, especially at the VA, exercise means jumping uh, tall hey. buildings in a single bound to these soldiers. <laughs> All right? So I say, you have to move. Okay? If it's 10 minute walk, and they look at me, I say, I'm sorry. You're not doing it now, you've got to do 10 minute walk. Maybe next week you can do 12, and then 15, and then 20, and then, then you can get up to your hour. But you're not going to be running. And if you pain, if you heal, feel pain after what you did, you overdid it. Okay? Listen to your body. Movement is important. Keep those muscles signaling the brain, and whatever the brain is contributing to what's going on, you've got to keep that signaling going. Staying in bed is not an answer. It can just make things worse. And if you're already in bed, getting out is tough. And there are other things that you can't do, but any kind of movement is good. 
I had a patient yesterday who had really serious injury to his uh, leg. He said, I can't walk, I can't walk very far, and I can't swim because I can't kick. I said, oh, well, what are you going to do to move? I, I said, you can move. <laughs> you, know, you got upper extremities. You can paddle on a little paddle board. You can, you can do other things like getting up and down and doing gentle walking. He's got a little dog. Can only walk him for five minutes. That's good. Do it five times a day. And you've gotten 25 minutes of walking. Don't do half hour, because that'll cause you to have so much pain you won't do it again. Don't want you to do that. So yeah, you've got to be creative. Okay. That, that, I hope that helps. We're going to alternate questions with the online oh, you audience. Have online too. Okay. Uh, we good. have a question about what is the better medicine, Embro or Humira, for rheumatoid arthritis? I wish I could answer that. We just try which one works better. I go to my patients and say they target the same treatment. It just depends which one works for you. We don't understand why one would work for one patient uh, and another one work better for another patient. Or when we switch, they're different. So I try, and I, I usually say, would you rather take a shot every week, which means it's only in your system for a week, and if you had a bad reaction, it'll be gone, or do you want to do something every two weeks because it's easier? I said, it's your decision. I can't give you an answer. I don't know. They are slightly different in, in how they're uh, uh, compounded, but yeah, they work just as well in, in the population numbers. But if it doesn't work for a patient, we will switch it to something else. Thank you. Um, you mentioned earlier that uh, Native American people might have a greater incidence of rheumatoid arthritis. I wondered if you also found that Asian um, um, people of Asian ethnicity might also, since I think there's a connection between Native Americans and Asian yeah. um, That's a very races. good question, for sure. Yeah. I, um, you know, that, that correlation, it was just a specific tribe of Puma Indians that had more rheumatoid arthritis and inflammatory conditions. But there hasn't been a, a, enough to say that um, Asian being a very large conglomerate of a lot of different populations has any increased uh, incidence. Um, there have been some little studies. There was some suggestion that maybe Native Hawaiians did, but there's some socioeconomic things that are in there and diet and, and exposures that we don't understand. So, yeah, I wish I could answer that better. But that is a very good question. But, you know, I don't know how it would help us because it has. we've known about the Puma Indians for 20 years or more, and we haven't been able to figure out why it is and maybe how that would help us. So that's the piece that I'm worried about. It didn't help. Yes, next question. Oh, there you are. Thank you. Uh, yes, you mentioned that brain stress, reducing brain stress could alleviate some of the symptoms. By brain stress, do you mean what we just commonly call being stressed? Yeah, I would say right. commonly feeling. That's how we feel it. Okay. What exactly is happening in the brain, in all cases, we're not sure. So try to, if you have symptoms like this, try to, for any symptoms of pain particularly, try to figure out where your stresses are. The stresses could just be the, the, the family or the you know, worries about finances or you know, if you work for the federal government, you might not have any finances for a while. Um, you know, so we all have stresses, but we sometimes overreact to them. And psychologists can help you not react adversely. You still have the stress. They can't take the stresses away. It's just kind of, all right, that the stress is going to be there. My worrying about it and my stressing about it is not going to take it away. So why let it hurt me? That's my, my very mini psychological thing about that. So, yeah, we don't understand it, but we do know that much more calm people who are not anxious about their symptoms have less symptoms. It's amazing. So this is a clue <laughs> that the brain has something to do with inflammation, and we do know this. There, I, I did some experiments. I'm sorry to say I caused arthritis in rats when I was in training. Okay. And during the time, there was uh, some studies that had done that um, to induce arthritis in certain species, you could do it by doing injections and stuff. But if you cut the nerves to that, that um, extremity, it didn't get arthritis. Uh, what do the nerves have to do with this? You know, I don't think we've, we know in quite enough. We know a little bit about this, but not enough. So I, I extrapolated because I know my patients who are less stressed. If they're calm... You know, learn Tai Chi, learn some meditation. It helps. Yeah. I wish I knew how and why, but if it helps, hey, do it. And it's not, not painful, and it's not, unless you get in these really weird positions, and it's not costing you anything. It just costs your time a little bit, and it's not very much. So that's my feeling about stress. Thank you.
Thank you. There's an online question. Will supplements like xanthosin and turmeric help with inflammation? Well, you know, there's a lot of... It probably, but we don't know for sure. Yeah. You know, yes, there's a lot of stuff out there that claims to be good for inflammation. I don't know. It hasn't been studied in the way in which medicine would like to see it. There's no randomized control studies. How do you get turmeric? Well, somebody chops up turmeric root, or do you eat it, or do you cook it? What do you do with it? I mean, when you do the studies, they use pure stuff. You may remember um, a chondroitin sulfate, and what was that? Uh, Glucosamine. Glucosamine, yeah, but there was a, a compound with that. Turns out it worked very, very well in Germany, but not in the U.S. when they did the studies. And the reason was that they'd used a different compound, and they had it differently made for the studies in Germany, but what's available out there was not the same thing. So when it was, when they did a, it wasn't a very great study. When they did a study in the U.S., it didn't work as well, because we don't know what's in some of the stuff that you can buy. So that's, be, be cautious, especially now that I, I get these reports all the time that the FDA said, oh, we found stuff that's not supposed to be there. I had a patient in Guam. This is a gout thing. He, um, I, I do Guam rheumatology by virtual. The patient said, oh, this is great. This stuff is great. I went down to my corner mom and pop shop and I got it and it really feels good. And I said, oh, that's really interesting. I'll, let me find out what it is. The, the, uh, it, it, they got it from the Philippines. And the Philippine Rheumatology Society, which I didn't know it exist, had found out that it had prednisone in it. And remember I said phenylbutazone, which could kill you? These are, these are barred. They're not supposed to be in there. And they couldn't sell it. It's not available in the Philippines in a pharmacy. You have to go to some fly-by-night place to get it. And they, they imported it into the uh, medical, not the medical, but the mom-and-pop shops, shops in Guam. So I've, be careful. <laughs> Thank you. That's kind of scary. Uh, we'll do have one last question from the back. Uh-huh, yes. They're very effective. Actually, the patients, it's, I've had a couple of patients who I didn't start on them, um, one of whom um, I had this running uh, problem with who really didn't want to come off of it, but he had had a heart attack, and I said, I'm sorry, there's a black box warning. And he wasn't my patient, actually. I was covering for somebody else. And I said, I can't give this to you. It's a black box morning. I don't want to kill you. I don't know you. <laughs> Even if I knew you, I didn't want to kill you. But, but it, it was so effective. And so as time went on, it wound up, he did go back on it because that was the only thing that actually worked for him. But it worked very well. But also it's a pill, and it's so much easier to take than the shots. But the shots are very easy to take. They're like insulin. They're very small needles, and you do subcutaneous, and it doesn't even hurt. So, yeah, I, it, I think it's, it's a transition to learning some more about some other cell-cell communications that we're going to learn about. We've got to find out why the side effects are there. We don't know. And whether they're important. And why did the FDA put this black box warning on it? It's still there. I just checked yesterday to see if they ever took it off because there was some conversation that they maybe should take it off, but they didn't. So, yeah, yeah um, there, we all have to be cautious not only for over-the-counter things, but drugs that we use, and make sure we're using them with full knowledge and the, with the risks and the benefits. So, yeah. But I think it's a pathway to the next set, of whatever they will be. And maybe, maybe, maybe the bacteria now got, will wipe it all out. I don't know. <laughs> that would be the, I, I'm looking forward to hearing about that probably from, from heaven when it's time. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you so much, Thank Marianne. I really appreciate it. Please give her a hand again. Thank you for a very informative and interesting presentation. Really appreciate it.